not going to say much. So let's just pretend that we're having a private conversation and you and I have already talked through all the usual stuff, the heat, the humidity, the politics, your profession, baseball, whatever else is going on in your life, your work, your marriage, your children, your grandchildren, we've already talked through all the usual stuff. And then I just kind of throw a ringer in there and I say, what do you like to eat? And, and unpack that for me. Let's go into great detail about what we eat because it really is kind of important. And you would say, what sort of weird man are you, right? <laughs> what, what do you care what I eat? Unless you're buying me dinner, you know, why would you ask such an odd question? So I'm not gonna let you talk. I'll, I'll just be the guinea pig here and uh, I'll explain why I'm doing what I'm doing in a few moments. I'm just gonna tell you about my choices and the way that I've eaten for my 67 years. Fair enough? Sure. All right, you're gonna say, well, that's weird in some cases, but, but here goes. I like sauerkraut. Dad is 100% German. Going back to some things you and I were talking about, my ancestors came over on a boat too. Not quite as far back as yours, but uh, pretty far back. So they're Germans of Germans. So sauerkraut, I grew up, I liked it as a kid, I still like it today, and that makes kind of sense. My mom's half Irish, so I like potatoes too. More on that in a moment. Um, I like lima beans. I like liver and onions in part because liver and onions is what my grandpa ate and my mom learned to make it. She didn't fry it to death like he liked it, didn't burn the onions like he liked it, or a ton of salt on it, crusty old Irishman that he was. But, but I like liver and onions. Part of it is too that I drove a truck for a year or two when I was out of school. I drive for United Van Lines. Liver and onions was always on the menu at truck stops back in the day, and I liked it. I like lima beans because they came from an era of, if it's in front of you, you eat it. In fact, my whole approach to eating to this day is, if it's in front of me, I'll eat it. Now that's led to some weird things. I lived in Grenada for a year. You ever had cow's head soup? Soup? And I thought, okay, that's just kind of a, a name for it. But she opened up the pot the first time I had it and looking up at you, complete with its eyeballs, it was the cow's head. And the way in which you eat this is you're picking off little spits of meat along with the vegetables and stuff that's in there. And some do in fact eat the eyeballs. My kid lived in Beijing along with his wife and kids for seven years. And I was in Asia a number of times. I got into a bunch of different Asian countries. I ate some weird stuff, but I kind of liked them, even the weird stuff. If you say to me, I'll buy you dinner, I would say, what Vietnamese restaurant is there? Because that, that's my favorite. When I'm home, not tomorrow, because I get home late tomorrow night, but Tuesday morning, I'll get my early morning coffee, walk out to my little garden. I got a scissor. I'm gonna snip two different kinds of kale, different lettuce, what's left of the spinach, and some pea pods, which have been glamorous this year. And I'm just gonna munch them, not gonna wash them, because that's kind of what I like too. Right? See where this is going? What have I just done? I've explained to you my preferences in eating, and really I have no preferences because I'll eat anything pretty nearly, right? I'm not all that picky. And now you kind of understand a little bit about my heritage, about my weirdness, about my preferences, um, and you understand a little bit more about me. I guess the parts that I didn't get in there would be that uh, I have an, a condition, a medical condition of taking two surgeries now, it's called achalasia, ever heard of it? Basically the inside of your throat disintegrates through no fault of your own, it's not because I drink coffee, it just went away. So uh, I, I'm a slow eater now. And rice and potatoes and pasta, which I like, aren't, aren't easy to eat, I gotta, I gotta go slowly with that stuff. And all of this really doesn't matter because unlike most people, I didn't get COVID in the first three years or whatever the pandemic was going on. I got it late and I didn't feel too bad, but I completely lost all sense of taste. So my wife cooks wonderful meals and I tell her that's good. I have no idea what it tasted like. You could have put the hottest Mexican peppers ever on there and I would not have known. <laughs> all right. So now you know about me and what, what's the point? 
if you understand the medical condition, you understand preferences, you understand what I like and don't like, I'll go one step further. Jesus' suggestion with the words in the Old Testament and the New Testament is that, that there is a spiritual angle to the way that you eat too. In the Old Testament lesson, which is before us, it is literal eating. Later on, Jesus has this in mind when he declares to all who are listening that day, I'm the bread of life. He was not saying, come and take a bite out of it. He was using it as a metaphor. And, and it is a consistent thing. In fact, in the New Testament, the metaphor most often used by Jesus to talk to believers back then and now was not on the resurrection, on the way, and those other I am statements from the Gospel of John, the one that he came back to time and time again was, I am the bread of life. As a metaphor, that you take me and you value me and you cherish me just like you would a good meal. And that's what we want to get today as we go through this. The spiritual angle on the reality of the way the Israelites ate for 40 years in the desert but then also flashing ahead of the New Testament and say, how did Jesus use that background story to teach a great truth? Let's go back and look at the early verses of what's in front of you. This is 1500 BC. Uh, what's in the background? If, if you remember your Sunday school lessons or your Old Testament readings alluded to earlier, <coughs> originally it was 70 members of Jacob's family and his 12 sons and their kids and their grandkids who went down to Egypt because there was a famine up in the promised land. They were just going to stay down there for the time of the famine. But one of Jacob's 12 sons would become the vice pharaoh in Egypt. And Pharaoh himself was so enamored of Jacob and his, all of his family coming down there. He gave them one of the nicest parts of Egypt to live in and to raise their flocks. That was the land of Goshen. Very well watered, very beautiful part of the country to this day. But then over the course of 400 years, as Jacob, now known as Israel, stays there, and as generation after generation dies, and new pharaohs come into power, the Israelites are not looked on with favor. In fact, they're enslaved. And they're builders of the things that the Egyptians forced them to build. And the living conditions are brutal. Remember that part? That God lets them sit there for 400 years until there's the 10 plagues, God gives signs to the Egyptian pharaoh to let these people go. And then there's a really big one when the other nine didn't convince him that the angel of death passes over. And if you didn't have the lamb's blood smeared on your door like the Israelites did, if you were a native Egyptian, didn't have that blood on your door, your firstborn animal and your firstborn child died, including the king's child as well. That's the one that finally got him to say, okay, Israel, you can leave. Here's some money. Here's jewels. Take this stuff and please leave because you made my life miserable. That's about a month and a half in the background. And Israel ain't happy. Verse 2. The entire Israelite community grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. What had they forgotten? They forgot that God had taken care of them for 400 years, even while they were in slavery. They're still a nation. They had forgotten that he was making good on his promise to take them back to the great land of Israel. They had forgotten that when Pharaoh changed his mind and came after the Israelites, remember that story? And their backs were up against a sea, a, a lake, and two million of them, they got nowhere to go, and here comes the most powerful army in the Middle East. God parts those waters. The Israelites walk across dry land. The Egyptian army follows. God brings the water back. And he killed them all. They had forgotten that. They had forgotten the previous two weeks before this. They were in a place called Mara. After three days without water, they finally came to a place called Mara. And it meant bitter water. The water was bad. And they started to grumble. God said, not a big deal. Moses, there's a piece of wood there. Throw it in the water, and the water became drinkable. Nice little miracle. The point being, God took care of these people. And he would take care of them. And yet they were downright delusional. 
And look at how crazy they get in verse 3. Not only do they grumble, but they said, If only we died by the Lord's hand in the land of Egypt. And we sat around pots of meat and ate as much food as we wanted. But now you brought us out in the wilderness to have this whole community die of hunger. That is absolutely historical revisionism. They did not sit around pots of food and their life was not happy. And oh, we wish we had died in Egypt. All they did was grumble for 400 years. God had rescued them and God was going to take care of them. They're not even this six weeks into it and they're already griping against the God who has preserved their lives. If I was God, I'd incinerated all two million of them. Maybe I'd keep Moses and Joshua, a couple of them, and start over. But I'd fry them on the spot. In an act of grace, you realize there's grace in the Old Testament, right? Here's God acting in grace. Look again at verse 4. The Lord said to Moses, watch what I'll do. I'll rain down bread from heaven for you and the people. Go out each day and gather enough for that day. And this way I'll test whether they follow my instructions or not. And I'll flash over to verse 13, the second part of it. In the morning, a layer of dew surrounded the camp. And then 14, when the layer of dew was gone, there were thin flakes on the surface of the wilderness, thin as frost on the ground. He showed him grace, and he fed him in a miraculous way. And it didn't just go on for a week. It continues for another 39 plus years. Every morning, like clockwork, six days in the week, there would be two quarts worth of these flakes out there after the dew was gone. We, we don't have a picture of this. It, it's described as something like coriander seed. It, it's described as something that you could boil and it would make maybe something like oatmeal. It's described as something that you could fry and maybe you'd have little mini pancakes out of it. And it's described as something that you could pick up and just eat like a cracker, a small cracker that tasted a little bit like honey. But it's there every day, six days of the week. And the six days of the week, it's not just two quarts per person, four quarts. And God said, and it's not going to spoil overnight. This is going to hold out for 48 hours to feed you through the Sabbath day when you're not supposed to work. That was his miraculous way of keeping them alive. What did they call it? Manna. Hebrew word for, what is it? They called it manna for 39 years because they never did come up with a better name. <laughs> it's the what is it stuff. We had never seen anything like it, never would see it again. It just showed up for 40 years and it kept 2 million plus people alive. This is not just a Sunday school lesson for children. This is adult level stuff because what's being taught here is both an Old Testament principle but it's got New Testament implications as well. Number one, these people are absolutely desperate and dependent and that if God doesn't feed them, they got nothing. It's not like there was a line of restaurants and 7-Elevens they could go in and just get food for, seven million, for two million people. They got nothing. When we come in front of Jesus, we come like we talked about in Bible class. Lord, I got nothing. I'm absolutely dependent on you, physically and spiritually. Second thing, they got no substitute. They don't have any options. You better get used to the wafers, along with the partridges that show up at night, because that's going to be your diet for 39 years. Maybe once in a while there'll be traders coming through. You can buy some vegetables and stuff like that, but that, that's your food for an entire 40 years. No substitute. Encounter Jesus, it's not like he's one of many Jesus is. He's it. That's the Savior of the world. Another way to look at this, it was for everybody. There's enough food there for two million people. Everybody got some. And he didn't say there was more for the wealthy than there was for the poor. Everybody got the same share. Sounds like the gospel, doesn't it? Not for the rich or the poor, the black or the white, or the male or female. God says, here's grace for everybody. For how long? For everybody. For all eternity. And, and then finally, God in his own direct way is saying, I've been compassionate. I'm keeping you alive. But you either use it or die. And the gospel has got kind of that asterisk there too. Here's the good news. I've taken all your sins away. You don't think that's true. You reject that. 
you die in hell. That's the parallel between the Old Testament story and New Testament truth. And this shows up, this concept of eating, is kind of a spiritual experience, shows up in the Psalms. The Psalmist says, taste and eat that the Lord is good. Taste and eat that the Lord is good. He's not talking about dinner. He's talking about interacting with God. In the Old Testament, they did that with the Passover meal. That was their high holy day. What was on that table? They had lamb, they had bread, they had wine, they had bitter herbs something like horseradish, we think. And that was to commemorate the Passover where God rescued them and brought them out of Egypt. But it also looked forward to when Messiah, his name is Jesus, would come. And Jesus took that Passover meal with his disciples on Monday, Thursday, and said, I'm going to turn this into something different now. We call it communion, the Lord's Supper. It's the same thing. It's a visual effect. You're putting something in your mouth. You're drinking something. And God's saying to you in a very personal way, you're a forgiven child of God. Even when you don't have it on a Sunday morning, like this morning, we're not having the Lord's Supper, right? You got the word to assure you that that's taste and eat that the Lord is good. You're a forgiven child of God. That's spiritual bread. And it matters because there comes a point in time where you got nobody else and you're flat on your back in a nursing home or in a hospital and it's you and God and that's it. And you can go back to this and say he has fed me well he's put faith in my heart and I remain a child of God even as I'm about to go to heaven right yeah. well that's the story what are the New Testament implications again Jesus used this metaphor more than any other metaphor because he knew the audience that he was speaking to understood what a miraculous thing that was that people received bread in a miraculous way for 40 years they knew their history. They knew that story. They knew that bread was the centerpiece of their meals in the Middle East. I think it kind of goes like this, right over our head. We just don't get that, do we? <clears throat> Unless you're like my grandpa, that crusty old man that liked liver mm -hmm. like that. You know his favorite meal, as much as you like liver and onion? Bread with gravy on it. Where'd you pick up that habit, Grandpa? 1930. That's all we had. My parents were kids in the 1930s. They weren't kids. That's what they had. And it remained my crusty Irish grandfather's favorite meal. If he had a choice, he'd say to my grandma, Essie, I think I'd like bread and gravy tonight. There you go. Pretty easy guy to cook for, right? <laughs> so if you're like him, you have bread's the centerpiece. Or if you're like me, when I was a kid, the other side of the family, when Grandma Pearl made the rolls, homemade rolls for Thanksgiving dinner, that's all we wanted. Nuts for the yams, even if they got marshmallows on them, forget the turkey, <laughs> the weird vegetables, nah. Okay? Give me more rolls. We were all little breadheads. Sapped in jam that she had made or honey. That was the centerpiece of the meal. Or to this day, if you live in the Middle East, the centerpiece of their diet is bread. Ethiopian restaurant, you ever been in one? The bread is kind of spongy. It looks like black cloth. And it's not just something you eat, it's what you do everything else with. You dip it into stews and soups, and you eat with that. That's kind of your fork and your spoon is your bread. It's the centerpiece of it. We gotta learn to think like that because that's basically what God is saying here. This bread, not the wafers any longer, not a loaf of bread like Jesus fed the 5,000 with, but this, this bread is the gospel. And it's the centerpiece of everything. And I think there's at least several challenges to that idea of just how important this bread is and that, and that we need to taste it regularly because, because we are spiritually hungry and, and that's all there is. First challenge would be this. We're not sure we got time for something that's, that's gonna take that long. You want an hour of worship out of me? You want two hours? You want Sunday school and Bible class to be tacked on? You really think I got time to read in the book in the course of a week? That's asking for a lot. 
was a series of churches in Phoenix, Arizona about 15 years back that said, we got the answer for the uh, world that's too busy for Christian worship like this. That church bought up four locations of a bank that had gone out of business. They took the stuff and remodeled it, and they had drive through church. I'm not making this up. You could pull up like you pull up to a drive through bank nowadays, and you hit a speaker, somewhat like the old drive-in theaters. You hit a speaker, and you got your sermon kind of thing for the day. No prayers, no communion, nothing like that. Oh, yeah, but there was communion. If you wanted a packet for that, little packets, like crackers and cheese, the peanut butter and crackers, and you just popped it open, there's a little piece of bread in there, some grape juice, you self-communed yourself, your offering, stick it in the tube, left over from the bank, flash it up inside, somebody will take your offering. And you're in and out in 20 minutes. And they thought that was a good strategy because people just don't have time for church. Or they say, you know, because we're in a hurry, we'll take junk food. We'll just take junk food. Give me some pious platitudes. Uh, tell me a few quick things. Because I don't have time to go see much in depth. I, I think the first thing that you take away from this is, is the Bible needs time. The gospel message needs time. If you're going to comprehend and apply it fully, you've got to take some time, some serious time on Sunday morning throughout the week. Second challenge. We tend to be picky eaters. I told you how I am. I got my faults, but I'm not a picky eater. I'll eat anything you put in front of me. But we tend as a culture to be pretty picky eaters. I don't know how somebody can say, that's broccoli, I'm not gonna eat that. Well, of course you would eat it, it's in front of you. Or I'm a beef eater, I don't like pork. Or I'll eat trout, but I don't like shellfish. I, I don't get that, but you understand what I'm saying, and maybe I'm picking on some of you now, right? We're picky eaters. Fine if you're a picky eater, but when it comes to the gospel, the biblical message, you don't get to pick and choose. But boy, we like to do that, don't we? I'll take the main course. I'll take the gospel. I'll take forgiveness, promise of eternal life. It's kind of like that. Oh, the side dishes are, I'm going to confine your human sexuality. It stays within the confines of marriage. I'm going to confine your speech. I want you to watch how you talk and reflect Jesus' words, not normal cuss words like everybody else. I want you to behave like a Christian. I want you to be the light of the world to people around you. I want you even to hang out with non-Christian people. Oh, man, Lord, I don't know if I like that diet. You know, I'm a picky eater. I'm a picky spiritual person. God has spread a rich menu in front of you. The gospel's there. But so is the law. And so is the mandate that we live like forgiven people of God. And that we do want to pick our words carefully. We do want to hang out with people who are Christian. That they might see Christ through us. And the third challenge of this whole idea of bread being what God is offering to us, the challenge that I see is I think we get tired of the same old menu. I kind of understand if I've been a Jew wandering through that God-forsaken desert, and it still is a God-forsaken desert between Cairo, Egypt, and Tel Aviv and Israel, that is nothing but a desert. No better nowadays than it was back then. Nobody fights over that piece of ground. It, it's awful. That's where the Israelites were. I, I get it. If they're wandering around in there for 39 years and the menu every day, guess what, Johnny? We have manna again today. What's for dinner, Mom? Quail. Day after day after day for 40 years. And I think that's how we treat church sometimes too. I, I, I get tired of the menu. I, I don't necessarily want to come to church and hear every weird critic that I'm a sinner. I don't want any bad vibes about hell. Who even believes in hell anymore and talks about hell? Why do we do that? I don't know that uh, I, I want to talk a whole lot about forgiveness, which is what we did in the Bible class. Because I, I'm pretty sure I get forgiveness, and I know how to practice forgiveness already. And I don't know that I need a pep talk that's going to take 20 minutes or whatever I'm at now, right? I, I don't know if I need this format. It seems to be the same thing every week. 
It is that way because the bread God's offering is the same thing every week. There is heaven and hell. There is sin and grace. And God has said by the marvelous working of the Holy Spirit that you believe in that grace. And that means everything to the Lord. And you can't hear it often enough. We get once every seven days. You probably need to hear it every day, right? We should probably have church every day. Remind ourselves that we are forgiven children of God. They started out by talking about my dietary habits. Hopefully you forget all that stuff. <clears throat> I do hope the analogy or the metaphor that's in front of you today, based on Exodus 16, the feeding of the millions with manna, brought into the New Testament by Jesus, that I am the bread of life, I do hope that that sinks in. And, and I hope that you kind of adopt as your mantra a hymn from one of our old, or hymn verse, hymn line from one of our old Lutheran hymns. Bread of heaven, feed me, feed me, till I want no more. God help you to that end. Go back to the worship service now. We would be at the bottom of page nine. Please stand as we confess our faith together.